Bonjour, je vous souhaite euh, la bienvenue. Welcome to everyone in the room here, a lot of people, and also uh, online, uh, because this is a hybrid uh, presentation. Welcome to the 2023 uh, uh, Justine and Yves Sergent uh, Award, and uh, we will have the uh, honor to uh, uh, recognize uh, excellence of a woman in uh, cognitive, inter uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience, uh, uh, just uh, in a few minutes. But just uh, as an introduction, uh, just to remind you, uh, the uh, Justine and Yves Sergent Award, which is um, so the uh, Justine and Yves Sergent Award is endowed at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Montréal in 1998 by the uh, Sergent family and by Mrs. Edith Lobier who uh, had the EGLB, Edith and John Lobier Foundation. The uh, uh, mother of Yves Sergent, Henriette Sergent, which was the kind of adoptive mother of Justine Sergent, uh, passed away in 2008, but was uh, present in all the uh, remittance of the price of the award uh, up until there. Uh, and also just to mention, that Mrs. Lobier, who received the Order of Canada, but also had a honoris causa doctorate from the University of Montréal, as well as uh, recognition from McGill University, um, unfortunately also passed away, but uh, they were both very, very involved in the preparation and the initiation of this, uh, of this uh, price. The, um, the price is to the memory of Justine and Yves Sergent, who both passed away on April 12th, 1994. In the context of a long-standing and profound misunderstanding, uh, including allegation of ethical misconduct for which an inquiry was suspended three years after her passing away without having raised any evidence. So just to remind us. The uh, Justine Sergent was in fact a primary school uh, person in uh, Lebanon when she met uh, Yves Sergent, who was uh, in Lebanon because of uh, his military service in France. Uh, and they uh, quickly uh, connected and uh, quickly uh, 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 married uh, and went to France for some months. But then after, both of them come, came to Montreal. And uh, Justine started her Montreal career, career as a primary school teacher. And then because of a brain disease of uh, one of the brother of Yves Sergent, um, she was interested in neuroscience. She enrolled at McGill. She did her master, a PhD, even her postdoc. And uh, she became a researcher at the MNI and at McGill. And all her impactful contribution to the field was made in the 10 years between that time and her, her passing away. So she was a, a, a brilliant person who changed a lot the understanding of the functional brain during, uh, uh, during her contribution. She and her husband were music uh, lovers as well. So it's not uh, surprising that uh, Justine was among the first to publish a neuroimaging study about uh, music. And they were uh, extremely close together. Uh, with no family, no children, and probably that's why they decided to uh, to pass away uh, together. Uh, she uh, published uh, very important papers on the website. You'll find all the papers. She she published a new look at the human split brain, uh, functional neuroanatomy of face and object proce processing, where she truly changed uh, the, the 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 field, and the and also sorry the first uh, pet. Sorry. The first pet study in science uh, magazine uh, review uh, on the music uh, and the brain uh, that was done. So a very important contribution. Um, at this point, when uh, they were in difficulty, this is the last sentence that uh, Justine wrote 
uh, before they decided to pass away. So um, the Justine and Sergent Price Award was uh, uh, put together by Madame Henriette Sergent and Madame Laubier uh, and myself to recognize uh, a woman of uh, international excellence uh, in cognitive neuroscience. Um, and uh, the uh, management committee includes uh, Pierre Inville, Dr. Inville from the research center here. I don't know if Pierre is here, not maybe this morning. And also Dr. Ekat Kritikou from the Faculty of Medicine, who uh, uh, unfortunately has some illness this morning, so could, could not be here. Uh, at the same time, the scientific committee just to, um, is, is made up of R.G. Illness from John Hopkins, Dr. Rita Ari from Aalto University in Finland, and Cheryl Grady from the University of Toronto. And this is the committee that identifies each year the uh, uh, award. The first person to receive, to receive the award in 1999 was Dr. Leslie Ungerleider, uh, very well known in the field, fortunately passed away as well. Uh, but the last, just as examples, in 2020, Maria Luisa Gorno Tempini received the prize. Uh, Nancy Ken Wisher, who was in Montreal a week and a half ago at the UNIQUE uh, meeting, uh, received the prize. Um, and also uh, Heidi Johansson Berg received uh, the prize. And this year, this year, the follow up of this excellence in cognitive neuroscience is uh, Professor uh, Dr. Catherine Amund. Uh, and so, Professor Medical Dr. Catherine Amund is has a, a lot of roles uh, in uh, Germany. She's director of the Institute for Neuroscience and Medicine at the, the Ulich in, in Germany. Uh, and please correct me, uh, Professor Hamunz, if I'm, I'm wrong in my description. Uh, she's director of the Cecil und Oskar Vogt Institute for Brain Research in Düsseldorf. She heads the eBrains European Brain Research Infrastructure uh, as well uh, in, in Europe and probably many other uh, role that I, I will not have captured on this uh, slide. She uh, graduated uh, from uh, in Moscow in 97 and 99 in medicine, as well as a MD, PhD. She did a, a postdoc from 92 to 99 uh, at the Vogt Institute. She was also a full professor of psychiatry and psychotherapy in Aachen uh, during a time. She received many or, many awards, the German Order of Merit, and also the Ector Science Award in 2021 for her outstanding research on brain mapping and contribution to the field of neuroscience. Among the uh, uh, accomplishments, uh, we can just cite the Big Brain Atlas, a high-resolution 3D digital map of the human brain, which is uh, just one of the example of the accomplishments. And I want to also underline that she's a member of the International Advisory Committee of the Healthy Brain, Healthy Life uh, CFREF uh, initiative uh, at McGill. Uh, and so this, uh, again, uh, is a link between uh, your country and uh, Montreal. So uh, I will now uh, ask uh, Professor Amunz to come here and to share with us some of the um, uh, examples of her contribution, and then we will proceed to the uh, award. Professor Amt. Okay. 
We give it a new trial. <laughs> so, okay, so as for Oscar and Cecil worked in Berlin and founded their neurobiological lab in Berlin, which belonged to Berlin University, and um, were studying the brain together with many eminent scientists like Corbinian Brodmann, that's a guy who is sitting at the window, Bill Shovsky, another very interesting person. And Oscar and Cecil in particular, they were focusing on the so-called myeloarchitecture of the brain. This is the way how stained axons are distributed in the cerebral cortex. And this is just an overview of different brain areas with their different myeloarchitecture. And without going into close detail, you see that the density of uh, axons is different, but also the organization. So some areas have less dense or more dense distributions in upper layers and others have uh, higher distributions in lower layers. And it's possible to identify 
certain cortical layers based on that. And the folks observed that this pattern, this minor architecture, is also a possibility to draw a map and uh, to parcelate the brain based on the minor architecture. And this is one of the beautiful um, colored uh, drawings uh, that we have in the uh, Cecil and Asker Vogt uh, Research Institute in, in Düsseldorf and um, how they, I mean, how their, how their approach was. And their concept, I should say, was from the very beginning a very comprehensive, uh, holistic, I would rather say. And if you think about, this is a concept that evolved in the 10s and 20s of the last century. And the folks uh, have created an institute in Berlin Buch where several departments um, were organized and the departments were for neuroanatomy and architectonics, no surprise perhaps, histology and histopathology, but also electrophysiology. So not such a, I mean, clear cut border between anatomy and physiology like we often have today. Unfortunately, then neurochemistry and pharmacology, which I find extremely important because it was long before it was clear um, what, what the role of neurotransmitters was. And indeed, her daughter, Marta Vogt, was the first who found out that corticolamines are not only located in blood vessels, but really have a role in, um, in the function of neurons. Then, Surprise, surprise, experimental genetics and human genetics. Also, long time before um, the DNA and the RNA uh, have been identified. Physiology, psychology, phonetics, biophysics, and a good documentation, of course. So I would, I would like to conclude that such an institute could be also set up according these lines today. It was extremely modern, and it was extremely advanced. And the folks, uh, or Oscar Folk was, was a doctor, also Cecile was a doctor, one of the first female scientists, by the way, uh, concluding the Sorbonne um, in, in Paris. And they understood that when they want to understand better how the brain also in patient is, is working and what can be done uh, with them to improve, um, then human brain research is particularly challenging because you cannot do everything in one and the same person. Uh, and uh, the approach that selected was uh, they joined forces with one of the most famous neurosurgeons at that time, Otfried Förster, and um, in order to, to better understand when the brain is being stimulated during surgery for epilepsy or for tumor resection, for, for example, what is happening in the brain, and they tried really to map the brain. And you see here in homunculus uh, uh, before, so to say, the famous homunculus from, uh, from Montreal came out. So, so this is, so to say, one school that people started to map the brain and, and started really to identify places where they can excite, uh, for example, movements of the hand uh, or of the tongues. And the other approach they selected was they went uh, to comparative anatomy that is studied brains of many, many animals in order to find out what are the homologies uh, between the human brain and those of animals. And the last point was, and this was related to Corbinian Brotman, Corbinian Brotman studied the cytoarchitecture of the human brain, that is the way how cells are distributed. And what you see here is a modern uh, section uh, stained for cell bodies, so all the black guys, these are neurons. And um, Vogt and Brodmann saw already at that time that there's a relationship between the so-called cytoarchitecture and the myeloarchitecture, architecture, and both has to do something with the connectivity. And we know today from many studies, again in monkeys in particular, but also in rodents, um, how the different layers of the cerebral cortex are connected to other subcortical nuclei or to other um, other cortical uh, areas or to the other hemisphere. Um, and um, this parallel development of cytoarchitecture and myeloarchitecture architecture also stimulated our own research. And if you allow me uh, this cartoon or this picture, you see uh, here the folks again, but this, uh, uh, this uh, Adolf Hopf, 
who was a successor of the folks in 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 the Black Forest and Carl Silles, many of you have met Carl probably and and myself and and I think in this continuation we would really like to bring folks concept also to the next phase and, and bring it to modern times. So what is the next phase? So when we think about an atlas or a map of the human brain, it is more like a Google Maps, uh, but for the brain and uh, like in Google Maps, uh, our idea is that you can zoom into the human brain uh, to the cellular level and also zoom out and, and get the whole picture, but it's also more. So if you think about uh, Google Maps, you can, of course, identify, well, I am here now in Montreal, and you can identify the road to Toronto, if you like, but you can even do more. You can also say, where is, for example, the, the closest restaurant I would like to have uh, dinner today? And you can also book a table. So it's not only a map, it's uh, an environment uh, where you can do your own uh, jobs, so to say. And the same idea is behind uh, our own atlas. So we start from the site architecture and uh, base it on reproducible mapping of site architectonic areas as Corbinia and Brotman started it more than 100 years ago. It's a concept why we consider intersubject variability because uh, we are convinced that this is not just noise, which we have to exclude to get more clear and easy to understand data. There is information in it. And this is of course most relevant when we think about patients. Um, we want to zoom to the cellular level. That's a big brain model. Um, link fiber and molecular architecture to cyto architecture and then use this framework in order to compare this brain function and connectivity in the living human brain. So um, I would really like to, to emphasize that we want to make cyto architecture, fiber architecture, molecular architecture, uh, a coherent framework where we always know the cyto architectonic area corresponds to that receptor or fiber architectonic area to better understand what the functionality of that area is, and then use this information and uh, superimpose this functional imaging data uh, from, from fMRI or from PET scanning, for example. But we start with the cyto architecture. And I did it um, in the 90s also uh, as a postdoc with Carl Silles. Um, and my first, uh, or one of my first projects was to, to study Broca's region, but then also the visual cortex. And here you see an example from the primary to the secondary visual cortex and a very clear cut border. So every student can recognize this border, but unfortunately this border is, is a rare example of where, where life is easy. Usually the, the borders are more difficult to, to be, to identify it. And the borders also do not follow um, gyre and salsa. And this is an example of the temporal lobe. So we cut in a coronal plane and you see the insula here and then the temporal lobe and TE1, 1, 0 and 1, 1. These are parts of the primary auditory cortex and they are really located at the Heschel gyrus. But we can find uh, a more fine-grained parcellation even of the primary auditory cortex. And it is somewhere at the gyrus and not necessarily at a certain place regarding a sulcus. And then come all these higher auditory and language related areas. And we suppose that TE3 has to do something with language processing, probably also STS2 and STS1. What I would like to emphasize is that one and the same area can be located on so to say, on both sides of a sulcus, like STS2 here, for example. And also some areas that are functionally quite different, they can be located within one and the same gyrus. So in some areas, like the primary auditory cortex, they have quite well relationships with gyrus. So you have all kinds of variants uh, in the relationship of aerial borders regarding salsae and gyre. And that means that salsae and gyre are not a good uh, indicator for uh, the localization uh, of borders and, and they are not good for parceling the human brain um, as, um, as, as a result. There are also, or even 
primary areas like area 17 here in red or areas uh, 18 uh, in green, uh, which are primary and secondary visual uh, areas, they vary quite a lot, as you can see here in these 10 postmortem brains regarding their size, their relationship to salsa and gyre, but also their relationship, how far they go to the lateral surface, for example. And the idea that we uh, developed in the, in the 90s was uh, we capture this type of variability by mapping 10 brains, five male, five females, and then uh, projecting um, the maps into a common reference space, which was the, the Collins space at the beginning, and now it's an it's a asymmetric MNI reference space. And when we superimpose 10 brains, then we can compute so-called probability map, which quantify for each voxel of the reference space the probability with which a certain area can be found at every position. And we were very surprised, honestly, to see how big the intersubject variability is, even though we have el uh, eliminated all microscopical variability in brain size or brain shape. So just when we look to microstructural variability, it's, uh, it's quite it's quite big, yeah? And this has, of course, consequences when we interpret results of functional imaging studies or when we also want to make conclusions on the localization on a, of a certain brain region, uh, for example, in a patient brain. So this type of mapping uh, turned out to be extremely time consuming. So one area, one, one uh, year of work, and we are not so much faster, we are better, we are okay, we are, we are doing more, but, but it's extremely time consuming because 10 brains, 20 hemispheres, and then really serious uh, serial mapping uh, in, in areas uh, that means, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 sections have to be analyzed per brain using an observer independent method. So it's still type uh, of very time consuming. And some, some areas uh, appeared to be much more subdivided when it was previously thought well, in the insular region, we know from Marcel Mesolam's work, uh, at least that there are three major regions, are granular or, or disc granular, but we have now already um, many, many more regions and we have not yet finished mapping the insular. And you may, of course, ask the question, do we need, do we need this granularity? Um, there are microscopical atlases. Uh, I mean, there are different AAL atlas or, or the, the Destrier atlas um, that passes the brain based on dry and, and salt side. But if you have a look to the insular here, of course, the insular, this is one big uh, territory. And if you have 12 or 13 or 14 areas within the insular, um, which have a different cytoarchitecture and a different connectivity and a different molecular architecture, then of course uh, it's important to have a better map as compared to have a one region map of, of the whole insula. And for some areas, these gyrus based atlases are okay. And uh, we, we find very good correspondences like for primary motor cortex, that's fine. But for other areas and in particular higher associative area, it is much more difficult and uh, gyro and salsae do not give you a good uh, estimate on, on what is behind. So because it is so time consuming, um, it takes really many, many years of research, uh, not only my research, but we have um, we have many researchers and guests and students uh, working on on mapping the human brain as we started in the 90s with the Jülich Brain Atlas and in 2013 we had only 77 brain regions only primarily cortical areas the first release in the e-brains infrastructure and we also started in parallel with the big brain model that is as you know a collaboration with with Ellen's group here in, in Montreal and uh, with reconstruction. So when we are looking today, uh, the big brain model has of course much, much more data now, a lot of downloads, a lot of community behind uh, and all kinds of sophisticated tools. And the same is true for the Jülich Brain Atlas, 
we have uh, now a release with 226 brain regions, including also many subcortical nuclei, many nasty regions, because they are really ill-defined and ill-described in, in previous maps. And we all do them using the same method, always 10 brains. When we can apply observer-independent mapping, we are doing it. And then we provide it to the community and now also with quite some uh, tools uh, that you can use and uh, where you can work with us. So the Atlas concept, so this is how the brain looks now, the Jülich Brain Atlas with these more than 200 areas. And uh, it's really great now to have also the Thalamus uh, in it. This is a collaboration with Harry Eulings and Harry started to work really in, in the 90s of the Thalamus. And now he is retired, he has more time. Now we are finishing it, but imagine 30 years for 30 nuclei. So it's quite, quite some, and we are, collaborating also with our French colleagues, with Bertrand Thirion, um, to map in the same reference space as the Defumo Atlas or the White Matter Atlas. And we link it to the cellular resolution atlas of the big brain and identify, for example, cell density for many, many brain regions, because we learned that uh, colleagues working with um, simulation and modeling, they are very much interested in true numbers from the human brain and not so much from mouse brain, which is also nice, but but I mean, when you want to simulate and model the human brain, you, you need this true data. And the big brain model is, of course, a very important uh, uh, cornerstone in, in this work. And we started to work on the big brain by the beginning 2003 or four, five, I would say, where we processed a whole human brain and cut it into 7,404 sections in Düsseldorf. And uh, then in collaboration with the International Consortium for Human Brain Mapping, and in particular with, with Ellen Evans, we started to reconstruct it. And Claude Lepage uh, was a poor person who really tried to eliminate all the uh, all the artifacts uh, in the histological section. And when you compare the first reconstruction with the reconstruction now, there's of course quite quite some difference. And it was challenging. It was a big data set, one terabyte of data. And we used uh, the Canary network also uh, to, to compute it here and uh, did this reconstruction. And then during the last uh, 10 years, we included uh, lots of data, for example, high resolution maps of different cortical areas um, that are available now for download uh, here on the eBrains website um, that, that we have developed. And this data has been used already now to model the brain of patients undergoing epilepsy surgery with Victor Gersa from Marseille. He and Randy McIntosh developed the virtual brain model. And uh, what, what um, Victor did was here, he um, imaged the patient undergoing surgery before epilepsy. Um, and uh, they are using EG data, MEG data, or fMRI data, diffusion data, so this is all kind of data you can get from this patient, but not the microstructural or, I mean, not cellular density. And this is coming from the Big Brain project. And then they are fusing the data and they make predictions of what is the best site at the brain where to remove the tissue. And of course, it's always um, a compromise. On the one hand, surgeons would like to take as much as they can uh, so that the patients are seizure free. But on the other hand, they want to take uh, as, as small as possible this tissue block because they do not want to have any side effects. And uh, what Victor now is trying to do is to predict it based on the virtual brain. And there is a, a clinical study ongoing in France now with, uh, with, with patients from 13 epilepsy centers in France, 400 uh, patients included. And, and next year, hopefully, uh, we will have the result next year only because one year being seizure, seizure free is, so to say, the, the landmark uh, that, that should be achieved. So we hope, of course, very much that it is happening. And, and I find it important also to emphasize that, that brain modeling and simulation, this is not something that is visionary and coming in 10 or 20 years, 
No, uh, although we do not yet everything understand of the of the human brain, of course not, but we can already transfer this knowledge into clinical application. So we are continuing of mapping this brain uh, with high resolution, and this is an example here of the hypothalamus, uh, where we also started the mapping project, and it gives you some idea of the level of detailedness that we can achieve. And um, we can use, of course, now these masks to identify what is the cell density, what is the model uh, that uh, that allows us to better understand the, the hypothalamus. And um, this is one direction we are going to. And the other direction is we would like to go to the one micron brain. Um, and um, this is a reconstruction of the big brain. And now in the yellow rectangle, we see a reconstruction at one micrometer isotropic. So this is really a huge data set and it is really a reconstruction at the cellular level. So when we cut the cells into two pieces during histological processing, um, we have them on different sections. Now we bring them together in one and the same section with a cellular level of resolution. So it's quite challenging. It's possible through uh, AI, uh, deep learning methods, of course, and uh, these these uh, volumes are already freely available uh, for the science community. But of course, this is a, a job that is extremely um, time consuming, but also compute consuming. So when we think about 86 billion of nerve cells, 7,500 sections, each single image is 200 by 100,000 pixel. So you you cannot simply load it in your computer. Yeah, they, they simply die during uh, during loading. So that the, the consequence was that we have to develop methods running on high performance computing for each single step. Yeah, because the data set is so is so big, uh, two to four petabytes, um, and we want to work with the data. Yeah, we want to read it and visualize it and analyze it and so on. So this was quite a pipeline that has been then developed since the last uh, 10 years to prepare this. Of course, it's not possible to understand the human brain just based on cytoarchitecture and um, receptor architecture is something that Carl developed in particular, he started in the 80s and then in the 90s. And um, the big um, value of this method is that it is multimodal, so we are, we are studying different receptor types of different neurotransmitter systems. And the second value I would say is that it is um, um, quantitative and we can really measure and femtomol per milligram protein, uh, the concentration of these receptor types and use the same methods of uh, identifying borders between cyto or receptor architectonic areas. So it's uh, the same pipeline. And you see here some examples for glutamate as an excitatory receptor, for GABA as an inhibitory receptor, and adrenaline uh, as a modulatory receptor. And they are, the concentration and distribution of receptor types is really different uh, in dependence on where you are in the brain uh, in terms of layers or in terms of areas. And it is also very different when we have a look to, um, to brains of patients with, uh, with Alzheimer, for example. So receptor balance is changing quite a lot. And uh, what we are trying to contribute is in, in doing it for, for many years now, what are, so to say, what, what are the baselines of receptor concentrations that we have in the different brain regions? And of course, you can imagine that if you have a drug that is binding to a certain receptor type, and then the receptor is differing so much in its concentration in frontal as compared to temporal, to motor, and so on areas, there should be an effect, of course, also of, of the binding of, of a certain drug. And, um, and, and we hope to better understand uh, the binding also in, in patients. But it also tells us a lot about uh, how the brain is organized. And, and these are four neighboring sections of a human brain. And the different colors codes the uh, different concentrations of uh, receptors of acetylcholinergic, glutamate, or GABA receptors. And um, we, we found that receptor mapping is extremely productive because we have different receptors and because they are so sensitive to the transition uh, of brain areas to each other. And this type of research allowed us to um, 
fine art parcelate Broca's region and surrounding cortex. And the classical Broca concept is, well, there are two areas, 44 and 45, that are somehow related um, to, to the motor aspect or to the production. And of course, all linguists and all um, cognitive uh, psychologists, they say, of course, this is a very rough description. Um, and how can it be that, that such a broad range of different functions that we can attribute to language and, and to, that they are only full or supported by, by two little areas? It's a little bit difficult to, to understand. When we now see that there are maybe a dozen area or even more, then we can think, of course, how these uh, fine-brained uh, concepts of language function, of syntax processing, of phonological processing, uh, of error detection, of grammar, um, uh, of um, retrieving information from, uh, from our dictionary, how they are mapping, how they can be mapped to the different cortical areas. And I think that's uh, one of the most interesting uh, research questions also in the field of language. And with Angela Federici, who also had the honor to receive uh, this eminent prize, we, we studied activations uh, that, he, that she um, evolved in subjects during sentence comprehension, and these are the, the red areas. And the question was, um, how uh, do relate these activations in living human subjects to the receptor architecture? And the surprising findings was that we found higher similarity in receptor architecture within language areas as compared to other areas. And I say surprising because some of the areas were in the Broca region, somewhere in the Wernicke region, which is quite far away from each other. So these two regions were more similar in their overall receptor pattern as uh, Broca, for example, to more dorsally uh, located dorsolateral uh, prefrontal cortex. And I mean, Broca is already, I would say, a little bit an ill-defined region, but it's even worse when we are coming to Wernicke and um, the concept of Wernicke well, if it's a neuroanatomical, it's it's not really precise. I would say the same is true when, when we think about what is the, the function of, of Wernicke's region. So we decided also here to uh, to start what is really the parcellation or the mapping uh, regarding cytoarchitecture, architecture and then compared with function and with the molecular and also transcriptomic data. And we identified uh, new areas in the um, in the region of the superior temporal uh, gyrus and uh, neighboring superior temporal sites, and they are here labeled. And interestingly, those parcellation coincided with data coming from diffusion tractography, where also a new area SMTG has been identified, which seems to be um, correspond with, with STS2. So again, there is a strong uh, relationship between connectivity as defined by diffusion imaging, for example, and, and the underlying cytoarchitecture. And the same is true with function. Uh, but of course, this is a more, more difficult relationship, I would like to say. Mm -hmm. And what you see here is a quite complex um, table that shows uh, on the x-axis the different cytoarchitectonically identified area. And then on the y-axis, you see all kind of functions that have been um, um, activated uh, in, in, in human subjects. And I would like to, to emphasize that uh, there is a certain pattern um, and certain areas, certain cytoarchitectonically identified areas contribute to a certain function but uh, there are very specific networks. Yeah? So it's not the case that brain areas, uh, cytoarchitectonic brain areas can do everything. I mean, certainly there is a, a computation that is similar, but they contribute to a certain type of specific function. And this has to do something with the connectivity also. And, and to see such functional profiles, I think is a very interesting approach to better understand uh, brain functions when you're moving a little bit away from the, um, from the primary areas. And we see also with very high resolution 
uh, imaging at seven Tesla or, or nine Tesla. That's the final parcellation that we can find uh, in the auditory region that they correspond uh, in a very clear way with what we see, for example, in the receptor architecture. So it's not like, like the brain is, so to say, doing everything everywhere and there are just gradients. There are gradients as one principle of organization, but the I would say the most obvious um, organizational uh, structure of the human brain are areas and uh, they help or they simplify a little bit the approach and, and, and limit the, the possibilities to look more specifically on what is the function of a particular region and why this function is uh, possible. And when I ask the why question, then of course also uh, the genetics uh, is, is extremely important and how to understand the genetics. You cannot easily do it in, in one and the same brain as in cyto or in receptor architecture. And here we took the advantage of the Allen Brain Institute uh, database and um, asked the question, when we have cyto architectonically identified areas, what is the gene uh, expression of those genes that are code for a certain receptor type? So we are comparing genes and receptors and cytoarchitecture and all come from different brains. One brain is in Seattle, one brain are our cytoarchitectonic brains and the third group of is uh, our receptor brains. And the interesting thing is that uh, when we make such um, comparisons and then cluster the different areas of different functional systems, then we see a certain order, for example, when we understand the gene expression, that's the left image. And you see also an order when moving from the primary visual cortex to higher visual areas. And visual areas are separate from, from auditory areas or somatosensory or motor areas. And interestingly, the pattern is very similar when you do the same clustering but for receptor pattern. So there seems to be really an internal organizational principle uh, that binds uh, molecules and their genes and their function and their cytoarchitecture. To, the, to coming to the end of my talk, um, of course, the third building block, I would say this is a fiber architecture based on axons. And um, we uh, invented in, in our institute 3D polarized light imaging. Well, polarized light imaging is there for, for more than 100 years, but making it 3D is a new aspect. And you see here an image of a horizontal of a coronal section and the colors code uh, corresponding to the sphere of the direction. So green means that the fibers are going in this direction and pink is in that direction. So the fibers are coding for the direction. And how, how do we do it? Well, we cut human brains into 50 micrometer thick sections and do not stain them, but image them with a polarizing microscope. And this helps us to identify not only the direction in plane, but also the direction in the third dimension. So we are computing uh, fiber orientation maps in three dimensions. So these are really little vectors. And then try to reconstruct it over their whole extent. And we find out that really there is so much information in it here. For example, in the mesencephalon, you see the red nucleus and the substantia nigra. This is also in the subthalamic nucleus. I mean, this is a very important region for brain uh, stimulation. And um, we do not yet completely understand why some patients benefit with Parkinson after surgery, but, but some patients do not so much benefit. And uh, it is, uh, of course, a well-founded hypothesis that this has to do something with the connectivity and the localization of the electrode concerning the connectivity. So what I would like to go really providing these high resolution maps to surgeons. And then combine these high resolution fiber maps, uh, maps uh, with cellular maps, but with different cell types. And in collaboration with Roxana Koymans from Amsterdam University, she is doing a triple staining um, in sections that we have scanned with polarized light imaging. 
And the idea is really to come out uh, with, so to say, with maps that very precisely show the axonal architecture at cellular level regarding uh, the cellular architecture. And that's quite a challenge regarding the different uh, spatial scales. And this is an illustration. So a voxel and MRI is about one millimeter and PLI, it's about, um, well, 1.3 micrometer. Two photon uh, imaging uh, is smaller and the electron microscopy you can even not, not recognize. And we want to have it for the whole human brain, uh, how, how to do it. We will probably never have a whole human brain scanned with electron microscopy because they are restricted to one millimeter. That's not so much, it's even not the cortex. So I hope that uh, polarized light imaging is the method that builds a bridge between the microscopy of the brain and uh, the cellular architecture. And this is a journey uh, to the cerebral cortex uh, with polarized light imaging. And you see that the fiber architecture is really changing sometimes here quite rapidly. Yeah? And, and the fibers are doing something completely different in very close relationships. And when you are moving throughout the cortical ribbon, then it becomes apparent how different the myelo architecture is. So this is folks myelo architecture, but in 3D. Yeah. And it's extremely challenging to image these brains. They have been imaged first uh, with Cyril Popon uh, at, at Neurospin in France, then they were shipped to us and then Roxana. So there's quite some logistics behind. Um, but I think it's uh, interesting and worth to do it because it helps us to, to bridge the different scales. And if you have a look to a uh, resolution of 1000 micrometers, this is MR, you do not see the intralaminar uh, with a, I mean, fiber architecture in the cortex. And this makes it also so difficult to trace fibers in the cortex with diffusion imaging. But when we have both methods together, we can also inform each other yeah, and, and can guide it. And I think the next step is, uh, and uh, when we can really connect this microscopy level um, to the level of, uh, of single cells, like here with two photon fluorescence microscopy, and you see astroglia here, and then bridge it uh, to the electron microscopy level. And the field of view is only 0.6 micrometer here. So it's very, very small. But having a template like the big brain or even the one micron brain allows us, of course, to embed such type of data into a common reference space and then also make predictions about brain regions that cannot be analyzed with one and the same technique. So that's a little bit the Atlas idea um, that, that I would like to introduce and that I would like to show you today. And um, let me thank my, my many collaborators from uh, Montreal, but also from the Human Brain Project that just finished. And let me invite you to go to our website, also to the eBrains website. And please do not give up. The website is not optimal, but we are working on it. The data are there, and we will supplement it uh, during the next years. So thank you for your attention and for having me here.